mentioned, I will be talking about self-assembled quads. Uh, don't worry, I will not go into the details of these systems. I will just introduce them as a model system that by now is very well understood and where you can do a number of, uh, I think, nifty experiments. But I still don't want to leave you in the dark what we are talking about. Self-assembled semiconductor quantum dots uh, have been around for now almost uh, or more than 20 years. They form when you have two different semiconductors with different lattice constants and uh, you grow one on top of the other. First, um, the second semiconductor will adhere to the um, lattice constant of the substrate, but then uh, under, under the right growth conditions and the right material combinations, um, at uh, higher coverage, uh, islands will form. And these, uh, these islands are given uh, by strain interface interactions and things like that. Uh, and it turns out uh, that they look very uniform and with, it, with just one growth step, you can produce millions and millions and millions of these and they look similar, uh, similarly enough that you can do ensemble measurements with, recent, uh, with the reasonable resolution. What's even better is that you can embed them in basically any semiconductor device you want to, um, lasers, uh, storage devices, um, you name it, um, and they remain their single crystalline uh, morphology. Um, this is shown here, uh, where you can see in white the rough outline of the indium arsenide and in darker the gallium arsenide around. They have a diameter of about 20 nanometers in xy direction and a height of 5 to 10 uh, nanometers, and what you can see here is how well preserved the underlying atomic lattice is. Um, and this will be the last picture that I show you that has anything to do with an atomic lattice. I will try to move a away a little bit from um, uh, solid state physics and show you the general properties. Um, and the general properties are that you have uh, a quantum pocket for carriers. And you can uh, look at the confining potential in the growth direction, and that's not very well known, uh, which doesn't matter much because in, along the growth direction you will always be in the ground state, it will be locked in, so nothing much will happen there. What's more interesting are the other two dimensions, the X and the Y dimensions, where uh, you will have a now well-known uh, confining potential and uh, you have several quantum states in there. So what we are dealing with here is a two-dimensional, quantized, tunable, interacting few electron system as a model system for many other uh, systems, I think. So how do we approach the energetics and the dynamics in these quantum dots? We started off a long time ago with capacitance voltage spectroscopy. So uh, you grow a, a conducting back contact uh, below the quantum dots and you put a surface gate electrode on top of the surface and you measure the capacitance as a function of the voltage. And as you have heard uh, yesterday from uh, Tomasz Nowotny, uh, the AC conductivity is related to the density of states. And you can approach it the way he did it yesterday, or you can think about Thomas Fermi screening, where also uh, this term, E squared times the density of state, plays a role. I use, usually like to think of it uh, knowing that the change in charge as you change the voltage is the capacitance, but the voltage is the change 
in electrochemical potential. So you have one term that is the electrical potential, that's the geometric capacitance, and you have one term that's the chemical potential, and that's related to the density of states. So usually you don't encounter the density of states when you do capacitance. That's because usually you have metallic systems where the density of states is very, very high, so you can leave it out. But here we have a very, very dilute system of states in this quantum dot layer, and so it works wonderfully. And uh, when we plot the capacitance as a function of the gate voltage, uh, we see these wonderful peaks. And when I show you plots like this, Think of it as, this is an energy scale, all you have to do is divide this by seven and then you have the energy in electron volts. And uh, think of this in terms of the density of states. And you see that in this layer you have a density of states at different energies and you see a spectroscopic fingerprint. And this is the spectroscopic fingerprint of a two-dimensional quote-unquote atom. And that's why the community has labeled these two states, the S-shell and these four states, the P-shell. But you, you, of course, have different degeneracies than in a normal atom because of the different dimensionality. And uh, be aware, this, the S-shell is not doubly degenerate because what we are measuring here is uh, not the empty quantum dots, but the quantum dots as they are filling up. So this is quantum dot heli uh, hydrogen and this is quantum dot helium and between them you have the Coulomb interaction. So the ground state of uh, hydrogen and helium are not degenerate. And it goes on up to quantum dot carbon. And uh, you can do a lot of atomic physics. You can turn on a magnetic field, see the Zeeman splitting, and so on and so forth. And this, you see, this is old work, uh, is what you get out of uh, measurements like that. You get the energetics as a function of the magnetic field. And this can be very well accounted for, assuming that in the xy direction you have uh, physicists' uh, favorite potential, the harmonic oscillator potential um, uh, in circular, more or less circular symmetry. What is also remarkable here, where you see signs of exchange interaction and things like that, what's remarkable here is that contrary to real atoms, you can go to such high magnetic fields that, for example, the uh, quantum dot carbon that uh, has a p-like uh, increasing energy in a magnetic field will suddenly completely change its orbital uh, nature and become d-like with decreasing in a magnetic field. For real atoms, you would need, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000 Tesla or something like that. Okay, but we want to talk a little bit about dynamics. So let me first talk about tunneling dynamics. So what happens when you increase the uh, frequency with which you uh, probe this density of states, with which you probe the, the tunneling of the back contact into the quantum dots, um, at some point your frequency will be so fast it will be faster than the average tunneling time into the dot and back. And then this amplitude will no longer be just the density of states, it will also be in affected by the tunneling probability. And the tunneling probability, again, is given by the wave function overlap between the quantum dots and the reservoir. And now, similarly, as people have done with scanning tunneling microscopy uh, imaging quantum states on the surface, we can do something similar. We also look at the tunneling uh, currents 
AC tunneling currents in capacitance voltage spectroscopy. And we steer the path of the uh, electron uh, using the Lorentz force. And this allows us to map the wave function in momentum space. Here is a very, very uh, cartoon-like representation. We have the back contact, we have the quantum dot layer, we have the tunneling, and of course, if you apply a magnetic field, um, your, you will, uh, so to speak, displace the tunneling current. And uh, you can do that now uh, in the different directions. And depending on how large the wave function will be uh, at this point or at this point, uh, you get a higher or a lower tunneling current. And you can map out the quantum states in these quantum dots as they are filled with one electron or two electrons. That's just the S state, so you get just a Gaussian wave function, more or less. A little more interesting are the P states, those you see here. For a chemist, that's quite clear. You have the Px, the Py, and in three dimension, the Pz. But for us, this was a little bit um, surprising. Uh, because we had thought we have a circularly symmetric uh, quantum dot. So you would expect that anything you measure would also be circularly symmetric. But it's not. And the reason is that we are in, the, in, in uh, a cubic semiconductor. And of course, a cubic semiconductor will distort this. And we have some xy splitting. And that's why the lower states are oriented along one crystal direction, and the higher uh, P states are oriented in the other direction. So this was very nice, because it gave us a very sensitive tool to look at the symmetry of the quantum dots. But there's one thing nicer than being able to uh, map out quantum states. It's to change them and look how they change uh, as you uh, manipulate them. And the easiest way to manipulate these two uh, quantum states is by applying a magnetic field uh, perpendicular, which will mix these states. And indeed, we were able to mix those, the Px and the Py state, by applying a perpendicular magnetic field. And uh, it was not large enough to completely go to a circular wave function. But you can see that you are going towards a circular uh, wave function. So uh, manipulating wave functions and watching while it's happening is possible with this technique. But capacitance voltage spectroscopy is still slow. So we were looking for a faster way to look at these um, devices. And uh, we went from this structure, uh, which is basically a parallel plate capacitor, to this structure, which is a transistor. So we still have the gate, the gate electrode on top. We still have the channel here. But now we contact the channel and send a current through and uh, look how the current or the conductivity of this channel changes as we uh, change the gate voltage. As it turns out, this structure is very similar to what every one of you has in his or her pocket. Because this is very similar to a flash memory. We have a source and a drain, a source and a drain, uh, and a, a channel. And then we have a gate on top. And in the middle here, in your uh, flash memory, there is something called a floating gate. And the quantum dot layer here, which is tunnel coupled to the channel is, in a way, our floating gate. 
And just the same way as in uh, flash memory, you read out the charge in the floating gate, we are reading out the charge in the quantum dot layer. And uh, indeed, we were able to build devices and use them as a quantum dot memory and uh, charge them, read them out, and do this sufficiently fast with nanosecond time scales. But uh, this is, would be something for a more technical talk, so let's go back to the physics, to time-resolved tunneling spectroscopy. Here is our transistor again, the source and the drain, and you drive the current through this electron channel down here, and above it are the dots. So what happens now when you apply a positive pulse to the gate? The same as in every transistor, you increase the carrier density in the channel and the conductivity or the current will jump up. But then, because at the same time you are bringing the quantum states of the quantum dots below the Fermi energy, electrons will tunnel through the tunneling barrier. The extended states here will tunnel into the dots where they become localized states. And this way, the conductivity will go down. So we can, in real time, observe how the tunneling of all these electrons in this layer into the quantum dot takes place. And this also allows us to prepare non-equilibrium states. So when you change by the gate voltage the Fermi energy in the electron channel with respect to the quantum states very slowly, then you will see the same thing when you plot uh, the change in current as a function of the gate bias. You will see the same thing as in the, the capacitance voltage spectroscopy. The two S states and the four P states not as well resolved, so you are filling one after another. But if you are bringing the Fermi energy up very quickly, you are able, because tunneling into the higher states is exponentially faster because of the barrier being lower for the higher states, uh, you are able to tunnel into the excited states before you fill the lower states. And if you do this and uh, look at the same spectrum, you see now the density of states of the empty dot ensemble. And here you see again the harmonic oscillator because you see three equidistant peaks. This is the S shell, this is the P shell, and this is the D shell. So now we can use the combination of the two to look at electron-electron interaction in these few particle systems. And we do that by setting our starting uh, Fermi energy uh, high enough that we, can, that we fill a single electron in each of the dots and then bring the uh, Fermi energy up quick enough that the excited states will be filled. And then we see the two electron excited, uh, the two electron ground state and the two electron excited states. And here you see uh, a splitting, which comes from the fact that one of the two is tunneling into a triplet state and the other is tunneling into a singlet state. And the, the difference between these two states is exactly the exchange interaction. So here we have a direct um, approach to the exchange interaction. So it's an, it's an all electrical way to selectively populate quantum dot helium in the singlet and the triplet states. 
We uh, work together with uh, theorists from Hamburg University um, who did uh, a, a numerically exact diagonalization of the two-dimensional harmonic oscillator and the theoretically obtained uh, energies and the experimentally determined energies worked so well, not just for the quantum dot helium, but also for the quantum dot lithium, uh, that it gave us confidence that this assignment was really correct. But you have to admit, we are at the limit of our exp experimental resolution because we have an ensemble and we have inhomogeneous broadening which is almost as large as the uh, exchange splitting here. So can we do better? And recently we have done the next step and while this is again a charging uh, spectrum where you can with loving eyes again see the singlet and the triplet uh, we used a trick to differentiate these two states better. And that trick is that um, this state will live much longer than this state. Because uh, nothing will keep this electron from just uh, falling down by 50 milli electron volts, that's the typical quantization energy, either uh, by just emitting a photon or coupling to the phonons or you name it, most, most likely it's actually emitting a photon. Whereas here, this uh, transition is spin forbidden. So you have to wait for a spin flip to occur. And um, this means that uh, this state will live much longer than this state and you can see that directly when you are no longer looking at charging, but now you are looking at discharging uh, currents. And that's shown here. This is the discharging current. And you see you have uh, a fast slope, which comes from the quantum dots that have been charged into the triplet states. Uh, and you have a uh, slow discharging of the dots for the uh, quantum dots that have been charged uh, in the singlet state. So if you now uh, take all these uh, exponential decays and plot the fast and the slow contribution as a function of the gate voltage, same as here, you see very nicely that this one here corresponds to a fast discharge, this one here corresponds to a, s a slow uh, discharge and so on, which uh, allowed us to really separate out these two peaks. So we are faster than the spin relaxation time. Is it possible to determine the spin relaxation time? And the answer is yes. Um, with the very uh, simple rate model where you first look at the tunneling into the different states, then the relaxation, and then we had to do another technicality because of the broadening of our distribution there is actually a non-vanishing probability that you also charge the three electron system, but you can all separate that out. And we were able to determine a spin relaxation time in these quantum dots of 23 microseconds. And we were a little surprised there is no other um, number in theory, to the best of our knowledge, we couldn't find any uh, where this spin relaxation time had been measured before. Um, I have to say, in these kinds of structures and in pure transport measurements. In optical measurements, these uh, spin relaxation times are very well known, um, but of course then you have the presence of a hole, whereas this one is the pure triplet to singlet spin 
relaxation time. Okay, so far so good, but I, have, uh, but I have already mentioned a few times that the ensemble broadening uh, is a little bit of a, gives a little bit of a headache because uh, we, will, we are always probing several thousand, sometimes millions of dots sim simultaneously, and therefore we have a limited energy resolution. The um, solution for this problem is to use high resolution optical spectroscopy. So the people in uh, the University of Bochum who grow these samples, and they're absolute uh, one of the world leaders in this growth technique. They grew some uh, samples that have very dilute quantum dot arrays. So with the a high resolution optical setup, we are able to address a single dot. And we are also using a relatively recent uh, technique to probe these quantum dots, and that's resonance fluorescence. It means that we are exciting a transition from the conduction band into the valence band uh, resonantly. That means our excitation and the um, emission are exactly the same, which of course makes it hard to separate scattered light from really uh, resonance fluorescence light. And I have to say it took us four years to catch up with the world state of the art. But we now have a setup that has a very high suppression, very low temperatures, high magnetic field. The resolution is single dot. You can see here a resonance. Uh, this is not done with the spectrometer. We use the quantum dot itself as a detector. Uh, you, we get a resolution of one microelectron volt and a time resolution in the microsecond range. So this, these are the typical um, uh, experimental results that we get. We set the laser energy to a certain energy, and you see the precision of this experiment by, by uh, seeing uh, where the first uh, relevant digit is here. So we set the, the laser to a very, very specific energy, and then we tune the gate voltage until we reach resonance. And you see the resonances here as these bright spots in this 2D picture. And you see that it goes up. That's simply um, the Stark effect, the electron state under the influence of an electric field. And uh, when you go through such a resonance, this is what it looks like. But you see that there is another thing happening, and that is that this resonance will die down as I go down in gate voltage, and another resonance pops up. Or if you come from this side, this is the optical excitation of the empty quantum dot called the exciton. And at this, around this gate voltage, an electron will tunnel into the quantum dot. And so we have the resonance of the trion here. And you see we had to change the scale quite a bit, so we are very, very sensitive here. And now we can do, again, time-resolved measurements and prepare our quantum dots in non-equilibrium. So we set the detection up here, and we set the gate voltage down here, so the resonance would be here. So in our resonance fluorescent, we don't see anything, obviously. Then we quickly change the gate voltage to around here, so that uh, the resonance will be uh, up here in resonance with the detection uh, of given by the laser, and then the resonance fluorescence shoots up. But the uh, system sees that this is not the equilibrium situation. The equilibrium situation is down here, and as the electron tunnels into the uh, quantum dot, the resonance fluorescence goes down again. So here we have the non-equilibrium situation that we could prepare. And this shows how 
a single electron statistically tunnels into a single quantum dot. So what happens if we change a little bit the detection energy and the, the resonance energy for the gate voltage, you see that it doesn't go all the way down. Uh, and that is in agreement with the fact that here it's not all the way dark and here it's not all the way bright. So in this situation, the Fermi energy in the back contact and the resonance in the quantum dot uh, are such... Uh, there is a little bit of a feedback. Maybe you can ask him to turn it down a little bit. Um, so that uh, some of the time the uh, electron will be in and other times the electron will be out. So it doesn't turn off all the way, just most of the way. And uh, as I said, that this uh, happens when you are within the energy range of the um, thermal uh, broadening due to the uh, non-vanishing temperature. So you can uh, now go through all the gate voltages in this range and look at this, uh, this amplitude, how it goes up as you go down here. And um, uh, what you see here, just by plotting this amplitudes, is a wonderful Fermi distribution. And you can um, uh, determine a uh, temperature from this Fermi distribution. And it's exactly very good agreement with the bath temperature of liquid helium that we have in our cryostat. So this works. Uh, really well. So, can we do even better? This still is a statistical measurement. So, uh, this process, preparing a non-equilibrium state, waiting for it to relax, and so on and so forth, was done 10,000 times, and this is the statistical uh, uh, exponential decay that you, you uh, find out. Can we actually see single tunneling events? And the answer is again, yes, um, we can. So um, here are, is the resonance, fluorescence, the light that comes out um, for the exciton. Um, as a function of time, here is in milliseconds, so we have a better uh, signal-to-noise ratio four different uh, gate voltages. So at this gate voltage, the uh, resonance fluorescence works very well. We're mostly in the empty quantum dot system. But then as you in in increase the gate voltage, uh, it becomes more and more often that the electron uh, occupies the quantum well, the quantum dot, and then you have more and more times when the resonance fluorescence is off, and this is even uh, more positive gate voltage. So here, most of the time, an electron is in the quantum dot. Um, so you can uh, look at this statistically. This is the on state, and this is the off state. It's very, very sharp, the off state. We understand why the on state is not so sharp. But what's nice now apart from the fact that we can basically tune the asymmetry. The asymmetry is um, the time, the residence time uh, that the, uh, the resonance fluorescence is on or uh, compared to the time that the uh, resonance fluorescence is off, basically the time that the electron is in the quantum dot and the uh, time the electron is out of the quantum dot. Um, the t or the, the, the typical time it takes for an electron to tunnel in and the typical time for an electron to tunnel out, uh, that we can tune this asymmetry from uh, minus one to one, basically, or to, to zero, whichever way you want, but what we have now, the PhD student who took this data with today's um, 
detectors and today's computers, she took half an hour data and has a time stamp for every single tunneling event with a millisecond resolution. And it turns out it's not that much of data. It's not terabytes. It's uh, more megabytes. But this is, of course, now really interesting for our friends in, in theory. Uh, and we're working together with Jürgen König within the Sonderforschungsbereich 1242 that Klaus has already uh, talked about in his uh, talk. Because we now have the full counting statistics of the tunneling event. So you can, in principle, look at the first moment, uh, the average, the second moment, the width, the third, third moment, the skewness, the, what's the next one? Uh, and you go on and on. But people who are working in uh, uh, evaluating full counting statistics, they are rather use the cumulants than the, um, the moments. Um, and that's, if I understand this correctly, because they're more sensitive to the smaller changes. And um, here are the, the cumulants. Think of something like the, lo the, the logarithm of the, 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 mo the moments of the statistics. Um, uh, C1 uh, uh, divided by C2, C1 by C3, and C1 by C4. So these are the normalized cumulants. Um, and may maybe the first one is... Uh, the easiest to understand, it's the Fano factor, which is basically the uh, average uh, of your count divided by the squared of the width. And for Poissonian statistics, and we are expected the tunneling statistics uh, is of a single tunneling event is expected to be Poissonian, you would expect that the Fano factor is 1. But we see that the Fano factor is smaller than 1, and that's actually quite easy to understand uh, because we are comparing tunneling events in and tunneling events out. Now, if one of the two is dominant, in this case, for example, uh, the, the statistics are dominated by uh, the tunneling out because tunneling in is so fast, and here it's the other way around, the Fano factor indeed is one. But when you're somewhere here in the middle, the Fano factor is reduced, and this is a statistic that shows indeed the, the width is smaller than what expected from a Poissonian statistic. It's the statistics is sub-Poissonian, and you can understand this by the fact that uh, tunneling in and tunneling out are correlated. You cannot tunnel two electrons out uh, and then tunnel two electrons back in. You can only tunnel one out and then you have to wait for the next one to come in before you can tunnel out again, right? Um, so this is quite well understood. And the theory has been worked out a while ago by Gustafsson et al. But with Jürgen König, uh, we are now going to the factorial cumulants, and we've recently been able to uh, really pinpoint in this huge number of data, this full counting statistics over half an hour, we were able to pinpoint uh, very, very fine details of the quantum dot uh, concerning spin splitting and spin relaxation and so on and so forth. I don't want to go into that, that's work in progress. Just want to tell you where this is going. And you haven't even held up any cards for me yet. Anyway, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> uh, and uh, that leaves me a lot of time to thank the people who have been involved. As you have seen, I have shown you data and, and uh, experiments that have spanned uh, two uh, decades. So a lot of people were involved. Uh, these are the people in, in my group. Wen Lei was uh, in my group too before he became a uh, professor in uh, Australia. I already mentioned the people at the Ruhr University uh, who, who grow these fantastic samples. Uh, Dieter Bimberg was a co the co collaborator 
in this um, in this drive to build a quantum dot memory. Gabriel Besta and Alex Zunger. Alex Zunger at an early stage was uh, very important. Gabriel Besta did the um, uh, PX and PY mixing uh, things, and I already mentioned also the theories from University of Hamburg. And of course, everything is about funding, and these are the funding agencies and the collaborative research center. And uh, these are the people who made it happen. In particular, uh, Paul Geller, uh, Kevin L. Trudis, and uh, Annika Kurzmann, who did this marvelous job of setting up the optics and is now proudly going to the ETH Zürich to be postdoc there. And I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. So thank you, Axel, for this nice talk. And also